In the last video, we visualized the master equation, which is used to describe the time evolution of the probability distribution for an ensemble or a population of stochastic systems. In this video, we walk through the stochastic simulation algorithm, which is used to calculate exact particular trajectories for individual stochastic systems. Here's one way we can organize a computer program. First, we specify the system we are trying to simulate. Then we use the current state of the system to calculate the duration of time that elapses before the next chemical reaction. And then we use the current system state to figure out what kind of reaction that next event will be. We begin by specifying system chemistry. In this example, we are inside a cell in which gene X can be transcribed to messenger RNA. The number of copies of messenger RNA in the cell is labeled XM. Messenger RNA can be translated to protein, and the number of copies of protein is denoted X. Messenger RNA and protein can both be degraded. To move this model from a back-of-the-envelope sketch into a computer, we use a state vector X. The first element of X is the number of copies of messenger RNA in the cell, and the second element of X is the number of copies of protein in the cell. In addition to specifying the system's immediate condition, we also need to specify the processes that can change the system state. The column on the left organizes a list of familiar English names we use to refer to the reactions included in our model. These are transcription, messenger RNA degradation, protein synthesis, and protein degradation. To calculate average time rates for these reactions, we need to use parameters, and to specify outcomes or consequences for these reactions, we need stoichiometry. As an example, transcription corresponds to a change in messenger RNA copy number of plus 1, as well as a change in protein copy number of 0. Transcription corresponds to a gain of one copy of messenger RNA with the protein level left unchanged. Using the parameters and knowledge of the system's current condition as tracked in the vector x, we can calculate the average time rates for these reactions individually. These expressions might look familiar to viewers who have recently reviewed the video unit on the law of mass action. For example, look at the time rate for messenger RNA degradation. It is a product gamma r multiplied by x1, meaning gamma r times the number of messenger RNA molecules currently in the cell. This is just the law of mass action. It is a product of rate coefficient stuff multiplied against reactant population stuff. We have specified the system with quantitative detail. We can now use the current state of the system to calculate the duration of time that elapses before the next chemical reaction occurs. Label these average time rates A1, A2, A3, and A4. Think of these time rates as the efficiencies with which individual dice rolls, representing short steps in time, generate chemical reaction events along these four simultaneous timelines. The temporal densities of these yellow, orange, dark blue, and light blue reactions across these timelines together give the temporal density of any reaction occurring, as illustrated using pink explosions along the timeline at the bottom. The time rates A1, A2, A3, and A4 add up to give A0 the time rate of any reaction occurring. In this illustration, we have just made a subtle mistake. After the first reaction occurs, the state of the system potentially changes. Because the time rates A1, A2, A3, and A4, and thus A0, depend on the system state, the time rates can also change. It is not necessarily kosher to continue to roll the dice with unchanged weightings after the first reaction has already occurred inside the cell and possibly changed the cell's contents and thus reaction time rates. However, for the purposes of this video, pretend that we did not bring up this delicate point. Consider a population of cells each described by total time rate A0. All of these cells appear to roll the same dice. We are not going so far as to say that each outcome of each dice roll is identical across individual cells and across time. We simply mean that each roll has the same likelihood of producing a pink explosion as its outcome. Delta T labels a time interval of observation. Within a time interval delta T, some of the timelines from a population of cells will have reactions, while others will only have dice rolls that do not lead to reactions. 
the fraction of the population of cells that has undergone a reaction during a brief interval delta t is delta p any event roughly equal to a zero times delta t the population fraction is proportional to the time rate a zero and proportional to the duration of observation delta t to understand the factor a zero we remind ourselves that a zero is basically the average number of pink explosions expected per dice roll for example, A0 looks like 5 pink explosions per 9 dice rolls in the timeline at the top. Roughly half of the dice rolls produce a pink reaction icon. The collection of dice rolls across which we count up reactions need not all belong to the same timeline. We can also look at the first dice roll from each of the timelines. Because we said that all the dice on the slide are the same, the density of pink reactions going down the page, looking at these five rolls belonging to the same time interval, but different timelines, should be similar to the density of pink reactions we just assessed going across the page, looking at rolls belonging to the same timeline, but different time intervals. Indeed, we see a density of two pink reactions out of five dice rolls which is, again, a likelihood of roughly half. Not only does the time rate A0 describe the temporal density of reactions encountered in a single timeline viewed from left to right, the time rate A0 also describes the density of reactions encountered in a single time interval viewed from top to bottom. When A0 increases, so too does the number of pink reactions produced by all the initial dice rolls of all the cells in a population taken together. For a short time interval, the fraction of the population that has produced a reaction is proportional to A0. To understand the factor delta t, we recognize that increasing the observation time interval delta t increases the number of dice rolls it embraces. For example, doubling the interval delta t doubles the number of all dice rolls it contains. This includes roughly doubling the number of the subset of dice rolls that productively lead to pink reactions. There are multiple ways we can conceptualize doubling the number of pink reactions contained within duration delta t. Look at the second timeline. When delta t is two dice rolls long, this timeline already has one pink reaction, and so doubling delta t to become instead four dice rolls long simply adds one more reaction to a timeline that has already had a reaction. The situation is different in the top timeline. When delta t is two dice rolls long, none of the rolls produces a reaction. But when delta t is doubled to become instead four dice rolls long, the time interval now contains one reaction, the very first reaction encountered by this timeline. For a generic value of delta t, doubling delta t will probably add reactions to some timelines that have already had reactions and add reactions to some timelines that have not yet had any reactions. However, in some situations, we might expect that increasing delta t allows delta t now to contain newly added reactions belonging only to timelines that already had reactions before delta t was doubled. And in some other situations, we might expect that increasing delta t allows delta t now to contain newly added reactions belonging only to timelines that have not yet had any reaction. These last two limiting cases help us to understand so-called long and short time intervals. For long time intervals, doubling the number of pink reactions embraced within the duration delta t does not practically increase the fraction of cells that have had at least one pink reaction. Most of the cells have already had multiple reactions. However, for extremely short time intervals, most of the timelines have had no reactions whatsoever. Within such a short time interval, some rare timelines might have one reaction. But it would be exceedingly rare and thus negligible for our purposes to find timelines containing multiple reactions. If the duration delta t is very short, then it remains very short even after being doubled, and so the fraction of the timelines containing multiple reactions remains negligible. This means that the additional pink reactions embraced must land mostly on timelines that have not yet had even one reaction. In other words, doubling the observation interval delta t doubles the fraction of the population that has had a reaction. Thus, delta p any event is proportional to delta t. 
On this slide, we have stated that for short time intervals, delta P any event is roughly equal to A0 times delta T. And we have understood the way in which the factors A0 and delta T appear in this equation. On this slide, we have also made the same mistake we committed previously. After the first reaction occurs in a cell, the cellular state can change. Thus, it is not necessarily kosher for us to continue to roll the same dice again and again, even after a reaction has occurred in a cell. Again, for the purposes of this video, we will pretend that we did not bring up this mistake. The purpose of this slide is to show that the relationship delta P any event roughly equal to A0 times delta T corresponds to waiting times that are exponentially distributed. Consider a population of six cells, each described by total time rate A0. After a short interval of time, perhaps this cell retains its original state and fails to produce a reaction. In contrast, this cell might have undergone a reaction. The condition of having undergone any reaction is represented here using a jiggling blue icon. After a short time interval, some cells have done nothing. Other cells that together make up the fraction A0 times delta T have undergone a reaction. The four yellow cells illustrated at the second time step look the same as the six yellow cells illustrated at the left edge of the slide. The purpose of this kind of illustration is to suggest that a similar fraction of these four cells will turn blue in the next interval, and that we get a similar fraction in the next interval after that, and that we get a similar fraction in the next interval after that, and so forth. Using the magic of animation, we can generate an exponential decay. The durations of time that initially yellow cells spend waiting to undergo a reaction to turn them blue are pulled from an exponential distribution. Some cells wait longer, some cells wait shorter amounts of time before they turn blue. T0 is the average of a large number of durations that cells wait to turn from yellow to blue, and we use the Greek letter tau to refer to particular waiting times for particular cells. To draw a particular time from an exponential distribution, we pick a number from the interval 0 to 1, with chances uniformly distributed. We evaluate the natural log of its reciprocal, and then multiply the output by the expected waiting time t0. A particular waiting time tau is obtained by multiplying the expected waiting time against a random factor that represents an exponential distribution. In this example, the computer has spit out a random waiting time equal to 1.4 times t0. The waiting time in this particular example is 1.4 times the average duration, which is 1.4 divided by the total cellular reaction time rate A0. When reactions occur more frequently, A0 becomes bigger downstairs, which corresponds to making t0 smaller upstairs. When reactions occur with a faster average rate, the average time spent waiting for the next reaction becomes shorter, and so we expect also to tend to find shorter particular waiting times tau. Now that we have determined the duration of time that elapses before the next chemical reaction modifies the state of the system, we need to determine what kind of reaction that next event will be we need to determine how the next reaction will modify the system. What kind of reaction will that next reaction be? The heights of these boxes represent the values of the time rates A1, A2, A3, and A4 corresponding to the immediate condition of the cell. A3 and A4 are similar in height, so the likelihood that the reaction will be of type 3 is comparable to the likelihood that the reaction will be of type 4. In contrast, the box for A1 is taller than the box for A2, so the likelihood that the reaction will be of type 1 is greater than the likelihood that the reaction will be of type 2. To determine the type of the reaction, draw a number from 0 to 1 with chances distributed uniformly. Scale the interval to fit the stack of boxes representing the time rates for the individual reaction types. In this example, our dice have landed in the yellow box corresponding to reaction type 1. According to the table we previously outlined, reaction type 1 corresponds to transcription. 
The stoichiometry of this reaction involves a change in the number of copies of messenger RNA of plus one and a change in the number of copies of protein of zero. We now apply these changes to the state of the cell. We have just outlined one way we can organize a computer program to simulate how the state of a stochastic system changes through time. First, we specify the system we are trying to simulate. Second, we use the current system state to calculate the duration of time that elapses before the next reaction occurs. Finally, we use the current system state to determine what kind of reaction that next reaction will be. Steps 2 and 3 can be looped repeatedly to obtain a trajectory of the system over time. For example, the system might start out with this position in state space, meaning this particular pairing of a number of copies of messenger RNA and a number of copies of protein. We perform step 2 to determine how much time elapses before the state of the system changes. We perform step 3 to determine how the system will move in state space. Steps 2 and 3 are looped to build up a list of durations that elapse between reactions and a list of changes applied to the system state at the ends of those time intervals. These calculations provide a trajectory of the system through state space over time. The calculations we have described in this slide deck are together referred to as the stochastic simulation algorithm.